Here's a question that I would like us to grapple with today. What happens to a nation that takes what is sacred and then deliberately desecrates and defiles that which was intended for holy purposes? If you were with us back on week one of our study in the book of Daniel, we read these verses in chapter one. In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Kind of interesting that Daniel here mentions Nebuchadnezzar confiscating vessels from the temple at Jerusalem. Because if you stop and think about it, that might seem just a tad peculiar, certainly a minor detail compared to the overthrow of Judah's king and the deportation of Daniel and many others. And yet Daniel calls special attention to that, doesn't he? He calls our attention to that in light of what would follow. So let me ask you again, in light of that, those verses, what happens to a nation that takes what is sacred? It takes what is sacred, like life, or marriage, or family, or truth. What happens to a nation that takes what is sacred and then deliberately desecrates and defiles that which was intended for holy purposes? We're going to find out today what happened to a nation. Grab your Bibles and let's go in the direction of Daniel chapter 5, shall we? Use your own hard copy, that would be great. If you don't have a hard copy, you might want to bring it up electronically, but it will always help you if you have the text open on your lap. And if you can read through it in advance of the service, that will also be more meaningful to you. Would encourage you to do that. Daniel chapter 5 is where we'll drop anchor this morning, and that's where we'll be spending our time. Over the past several weeks, we've been studying this book of Daniel in a series called Against the Flow. We gave it the subtitle of, we're residents of Jerusalem, but we're residing, we're living in Babylon. And so today's message, as you just saw a second ago there, is who's that writing on the wall? Or if you want to go with a more colorful title, we could go with this, it's my party and I'll die if I want to. Should have uh, an outline nearby if you picked one up. We make those available as you're entering the building. You can jot down some notes. You can fill in the blanks. There'll be some extra references that you can write down as well. I would encourage you to track with me in that manner. We'll begin with the backdrop today so you understand there's a shift. Where we last left uh, Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was the reigning king, but all that comes to an end, and there's a shift now in power. After the death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562 B.C., the Babylonian Empire began to crumble. Not only was there an internal weakening of the kingdom as its subsequent rulers disregarded the spiritual lessons that Nebuchadnezzar had learned, but there was also an external threat. There was an outside threat from the Persians and Medes under the Persian prince Cyrus, who now created a very formidable opponent in the neighborhood. Historians tell us that after Nebuchadnezzar's death, there was a six-year power struggle between Nebuchadnezzar's sons, his son-in-laws, his grandsons, a power struggle for the throne. Eventually, one of his servants, excuse me, one of his sons-in-law emerged, a guy by the name of Nabonidus. Interesting fact about Nabonidus was that he enjoyed vacationing in Arabia. He enjoyed vacationing in Arabia a whole lot more than being in Babylon, and so eventually the solution was to appoint his son Belshazzar as the co-regent over the kingdom, which freed Nabonidus to go play golf in Arabia. Back in chapter 2, verse 21, we noted these words. Daniel had warned King Nebuchadnezzar at the time that it was God. It was God who changes times and seasons. It was God who sets up kings and deposes them. And never is that principle any clearer than what we witness here in Daniel chapter 5. Within this text, we're going to focus on three timeless truths. I'm sure there are others, but I narrowed it down to three that were 
Three timeless truths that were pertinent in Daniel's day, but just as relevant and timely for our day as well. And the first one would be this, timeless truth number one, you need to beware of putting God to the test. As our account opens, the year is more than likely 539 B.C., and the great city of Babylon was actually surrounded by the Medo-Persian military. That fact alone, however, was not taken as a serious threat by King Belshazzar and most of the city's inhabitants simply because they had stored up enough provisions to see them through several years of siege. And besides that, the magnificent fortification protecting Babylon made the city virtually unassailable. Remember that the Euphrates River actually ran through the center of this city, which gave them access to fresh water. Not only that, but the city itself was surrounded by a large moat. Had a double wall that was 85 feet thick, almost 350 feet high. As if that wasn't enough, an estimated 100 towers built along that wall provided the Babylonian military all the advantages they need to virtually ward off any kind of attack. And so you can see why there might be a certain smugness on their part, on the part of its leadership, despite the pending doom that lurked right outside her walls. And that's why we read these verses, opening section of chapter 5. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. And while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold go goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. Now, the purpose of this party is not specifically stated. It appears that Belshazzar intended to boost the, the morale of the city's defenders while also demonstrating at the same time his confidence in the Babylonian gods to protect them. You can see there that this feast is actually de uh, designated a great banquet, right? A, a, a great banquet indicating that it was completely unrestrained. In other words, the participants drank to excess the presence of the wives and concubines here, which was normally forbidden, tells us that the feast was sensually sinful. And the fact that Belshazzar himself drank wine in the presence of other, others signifies that he intentionally set the tone of the feast as one of reckless abandonment. And then to make this back banquet a bash to remember... Belshazzar comes up with this bright idea of removing the gold and silver vessels that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. And in doing so, Belshazzar was defaming the Lord of Israel and exalting himself above the king of kings. I mean, it was bad enough to bring these holy goblets to this godless feast at all. But then to use them in this manner would have been the height of desecration. Look at it in verse 4. As they drank the wine out of these sacred vessels, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Can you see it there? Belshazzar is basically flipping God off, isn't he? He's flipping him off and daring, daring him to stop them if he can. The bold arrogance so flagrantly displayed in this passage should serve as a warning to us all that it's incredibly risky to put Almighty God to the test. You really don't want to go there. And as we read this passage in this situation, we might be thinking, well, certainly no nation today. I mean, there's no country on this planet today that would have the audacity to commit this kind of flagrant defiance, right? And that would be unheard of, right? Mm, you might want to hold off on that one. Back on February 5th of this year, we held a ginormous party here in America. It was called the Grammys. 
A portion of that grand gala featured non-binary singer Sam Smith, transgender artist Kim Petras performing their song, Unholy. Smith was clad in red leather, wearing devil's horns, while Petrus gyrated in a cage against the backdrop of flames. Dancers dressed as demons bowed and crawled around Smith in what many described amounted to Satan worship. And I find it incredibly noteworthy that just before that event, CBS had tweeted, we are ready to worship. Another party took place in our country just a little over a week ago. It was called Satan Con 2023. Hosted in Boston, billed as the largest gathering of Satanists in history. I'll save you the, the gory details and only mention that the opening ceremony, they had a pair of Satanic leaders who renounced symbols of oppression. And among those symbols of oppression, of course, was a copy of the Bible. The female, leader, the female leader shouted, we stand here today in defiance of their siege and destroy their symbols of oppression as she ripped up the Bible, tore pages out of the Bible, and let them fall to the floor. She chanted, hail Satan, while the crowd roared in applause. What was our question that we began with today? What happens to a nation that takes what is sacred and then deliberately desecrates and defiles that which was intended for holy purposes. Timeless truth number one, be, beware of putting God to the test. Time, timeless truth number two, brace yourself for the coming judgment. Verse five begins with the word suddenly, right? Suddenly. So in other words, while these depraved partiers are slurping their wine out of holy vessels, they receive the divine tab. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. So clearly what we have described here is a supernatural signal of approaching calamity. It wasn't the kind of warning, it wasn't intended to be the kind of warning that would enable the observer to escape but rather to notify them that impending doom is certain. These two verses, of course, have made such an impression on our world that they've given us a common expression that's still used today, the handwritings on the wall. You've heard of that, right? It comes from Daniel chapter 5. We talk about throwing a damper on a party, right? I mean, just try to picture it. The, the, the drinking immediately ceased. Loud, defiant mouths were suddenly silenced. Musicians put down their instruments. Dancing girls stand motionless. Waiters stop in their tracks. The murky banquet hall that had been drowned in noise now becomes deathly silent with terror gripping awe as that night of revelry became a night of revelation. We read in verse 6 that, Belshazzar's face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. I actually like the King James Version here. King James says, Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees smote one against another. <laughs> if you've ever had the joints of your loins turn loose, then you know how unsettling that can be. And even though Belshazzar couldn't interpret the message at this point, he had to know, right? And like, like in the back of his head, he, he had to know, this can't, I don't know what that says, but this can't be good. Finally, in verse 7, the silence is broken, and the king regains enough composure to summon his wise guys to see if they could interpret the message. You see in verses 8 and 9, it makes it very clear that, that they were unable to do so. Wait, what? What? <laughs> Like, who, who didn't see that one coming, right? Based on the pattern already in the book of Daniel. Finally, the queen, queen who had not been part of the festivities until now, which seems to indicate that it was probably Belshazzar's mother. The queen arrives on the scene, and, and she suggests an alternative. 
Pick it up at verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, and the Hebrew there is, is really its ancestor. So it's not strictly father. It could refer to father. It could refer to grandfather. The term technically is ancestor. So ancestor. So Nebuchadnezzar was probably Belshazzar's grandfather. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. Call Daniel. Call for Daniel. He'll be able to tell you what that means. Of course, by this time, Belshazzar is desperate enough to listen to anybody who could help, and so he quickly follows her advice and summons the prophet. Keep in mind that Daniel now, at this stage of history, at this stage in the book, was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85 years old perhaps in semi-retirement, which is probably why why he was unknown to Belshazzar. And when this man of God arrived on the scene, I I can just imagine it. I can just kind of picture it. Maybe you can, too. Just him looking around the room. You know, he walks in. He just, just takes it all in. The evidence of defiant wickedness had to be obvious, and given the opportunity, the prophet pulls no punches. He delivers a message meant primarily for the king, but certainly heard by everybody in the room. Let's pick it up at verse 21. The Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the Lord. You did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote this inscription, the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. The handwritten message came in common, everyday Aramaic terms. So it would have looked looked something similar to this, at least the transliteration of it. Remember that all ancient Semitic languages were written without vowel marks, and thus with no context to guide the reader, they would have been incomprehensible. The terms could have been read as names of weights or, or even coins, a minna, a minna, a shekel, a paris, Or in more contemporary terms, we say a dollar, a dollar, a dime, and a penny. Regardless, Daniel now tells us. He makes it clear. He interprets the message, verse 26 and following. This is what those words mean. Many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paras, your kingdom is divided and it will be given to the Medes and the Persians. And the picture here really is, is that of a cross arm balance with trays suspended from the ends by chains or cords. So you get the idea, right? In the eternal scales of the judgment of God, Belshazzar has been weighed, but he didn't even move the beam. He had failed miserably as a king. What does all that have to say to us today? Well, let's go back momentarily to verse 21. The Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. Belshazzar, you have not humbled yourself. Those same, that same kind of emphasis is found in very familiar words over in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will, say it with me, will humble themselves. We would be sadly mistaken if we, the people of this nation, concluded like this pagan king that we can continue to ignore God's warnings and not suffer any repercussions. We praise God for the Supreme Court decision last summer that overturned Roe v. Wade, and we should celebrate. Babies are being saved. But that doesn't change the reality that the innocent blood of over 60 million children stains U.S. soil. Proverbs 6, 16, and 17, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. I didn't quote the whole text, but right there, hands that shed innocent blood. 
The sexual perversion that brought God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah is openly paraded on the streets of our city, cities and, and promoted on our television and cinema screens. We have pastors serving on church staffs that preach in drag. We're mutilating the bodies of our children in the name of a transgender lifestyle. There's currently legislation pending in some of our states that would normalize pedophilia as a sexual orientation. I'll allow you to be the judge, but I'm convinced that the words of Genesis 6 and the days of Noah are an accurate description of our current situation where the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Are we really so naive to assume that God will just continue to look the other way? That's the mistake the Jews made in the Old Testament, right? That's precisely why Daniel and his friends are in captivity. Because their forefathers had reasoned, we're God's chosen people. We, we have privileged status. Nothing will ever happen. Nothing bad will ever happen to us. But God won't be mocked, folks. Observe these words from 2 Kings 24. The Lord sent Babylonian raiders to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to God's command in order to remove them from his presence. Why? Well, because of the sins of Manasseh. One of their, the kings of Judah and all he had done, including... What? The shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. Timeless truth number one, beware of putting God to the test. Timeless truth number two, brace yourself for the coming judgment. Timeless truth number three, become a godly influence in a rotting nation. Pick it up at verse 30, that very night. In other words, everything that we just read about and the night that all this transpired, right? King, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, the careful student of the word of God cannot help but be impressed by the accuracy of the scriptures. You see, years earlier, Isaiah had prophesied that God would raise up a worldly leader named Cyrus from the east. And notice the reference there to dry up the rivers in order that God's people, the Jews, might return to their homeland. Fascinating because now not far away stands this very same Cyrus who's referenced in that text while his general Darius plots to overtake the city of Babylon. And interestingly enough, the Greek historian Herodotus, so this is an outside secular source. This isn't a, a prophet, uh, a quote from a prophet. This is an outside secular course, uh, source, excuse me, Herodotus, who substantiates God's revelation with the account of the fall of Babylon. We know that, we know that Darius divided his attacking troops into three different forces. He stationed a third of his men where the Euphrates River entered the city, and then another force where the Euphrates River emerged from the city with the orders that both detachments were to enter the city as soon as the water became shallow enough. Then he and the rest of his men went up river and they diverted it from its regular channel. So on the very night of Belshazzar's feast that we're reading about here in Daniel 5, on that very night, the Persians drained the river and then entered the city, surprising its occupants. And that's why Herodotus here says this, long after the outer portions of the town were taken, they knew nothing of what had happened, but as they were engaged in a festival, continued dancing and reveling until they learnt the capture, but too certainly... They didn't see it coming, but it did. What was our key question today? What happens to a nation that takes what is sacred and then deliberately desecrates and defiles that which was intended for holy purposes? Well, we see the answer to that here in Daniel chapter 5, don't we? 
pretty clear. But what about us? What about America? I think in many ways you could make the case that the handwriting is on the wall. Does not our nation seem incredibly vulnerable on so many fronts right now? For example, some of our most powerful adversaries on this planet, some of our most powerful adversaries on this planet, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all have access to nuclear weapons and are threatening to use them. Or what about the economic front? Things could not be more serious. A nation that's already over $31 trillion in debt continues to recklessly print and spend more money. Our banks are collapsing. We're on the verge of defaulting on our bills while countries around the world are dumping the dollar as their reserve currency at an alarming rate. Or we could talk about the disaster on our southern border, couldn't we? With an unprecedented number of immigrants, drugs, and cartels pouring across on a daily basis, a situation that will only worsen if you can imagine it. I don't know how it could get much worse, but it will if Title 42 is allowed to expire later this week. I could go on. I don't want to drive you into deep depression today. <laughs> These are the realities. These are the realities what we're confronted with. Is the handwriting on the wall for America as a nation? I don't believe it has to be. But the challenge before us is very similar to the one that faced Daniel. We live, in an, we live in an alien culture that is becoming increasingly hostile to our faith. We're swimming against the flow. Residents of Jerusalem residing in Babylon. And so we need to acknowledge the scope and complexity of the difficulties before us today and then respond to those threats. There's still time and we can do something. But this nation will not escape the fate of past empires by continuing to party as if there are no problems. I'm reminded today of another pagan nation who heard a message from God. Uh, another, another spokesperson, another prophet, in one sense, his message was very simple. It was very straightforward. Prophet Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh, and what did he say? You've got 40 days. 40 days, and it's curtains for you. You're done. You're history. And how did those people respond? We read on into the text. Next verse, it says the Ninevites believed God. They took it seriously. They declared a fast. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. In fact, the king of Nineveh went so far as to issue a decree. Look what he said. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink. But let man and beast covered with sackcloth, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And who knows? Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. King issues an edict and calls for a national fast. Did it work? Was it successful? Look for yourself. Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them, and he did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. And once again, I would say it's the same emphasis that we found in 2 Chronicles 7.14. How does it begin? If my people, right? If my people who are called by my name. We need to lead the charge. We need to lead the way. We must exert a holy influence amid a decaying nation. Before we wrap up today, let's go back for a second to the queen's testimony regarding Daniel. Remember what she said? Queen Mother came in. She said, there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Isn't that interesting? 
I mean, you just stop and think about that for a second. Daniel's highly respected reputation as a man of God persisted in this climate of idolatry, immorality, and treason. Daniel has now been immersed in this culture since a teenager. And here he is, 80, 85 years of age. And what, what's his witness? What's his testimony? What's his legacy to those around him? He's a man who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. But people say the same of us. Because of Daniel's faithfulness, the Lord was able to use him mightily to influence and confront a pagan empire. And he can do the same through us today. I'm of the persuasion that God wants to use his people in a similar manner. God is looking for people of conviction. He's looking for people who are committed to him people who won't compromise his truth, people who will have the courage to lovingly confront a broken culture, people who will humble themselves before God and come before him in repentance and prayer. Gang, never underestimate the power of even one godly life. Bill Bright was the founder and former president of Campus Crusade for Christ. Years ago, he wrote an article was entitled, The Question of America's Future. Like I said, it was written several years ago, and yet its message is still timely for our day. So writing to the church, writing to, to Christ's followers, this is what Bill said. He said, we're not making the worldwide impact for Jesus for which our founding fathers dedicated this nation. We need to reconsider who we are as a people and restore God to his rightful place as Lord over our country. As followers of Christ, how will we respond to this present crisis? Will we help to restore the original purpose of this nation and use the tools that God has given us to reach the world for Christ? Or will we remain silent and simply watch as our nation and our God-given mission dies? What our ailing nation needs right now is great men and women, and I inserted there, like Daniel, what our ailing nation needs right now is great men and women who will rise to the challenge of the day, who will give us hope based on real truth, not on phony promises, and with godly character, integrity, and principle lead us back into the blessings of God. And then he ends with this question. Will you be one of those desperately needed leaders? It's a question that each of us need to respond to today. Will we be one of those godly influences on a broken planet in a decaying nation? We're going to end this morning with a declaration. And we can't do this on our own. The challenge is too great. We need the help of Almighty God. But it starts with our commitment to Him to be the people that he's called us to be in these days. So think about that. Make that your heart cry as we express this prayer to God in closing. Let's get on our feet as the team leads us. God, we desperately need you in these days. Help us understand the lateness of this hour. Help us to respond accordingly, God. Challenge us to up our game to get involved to be the people that you've called us to be it's not too late but we need to respond we need to be serious we need to be crying out seeking your help help us to hear that message very clearly today keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, God is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? And everybody agreed, said, amen. God bless. Have a great week.